Hi, good afternoon everybody and welcome back. So we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of uh, retail and how we're powering some of that revolution with awesome data. So uh, with me today I have Russell Sherwin from IBM and he actually runs some of the Watson uh, technology AI services and he's been thinking about how that and marketing come together. So let me have him introduce yourself and then we'll start get started. Hey, good afternoon. I am Russell Sherwin, and I believe I'm looking at that camera right there. How are you all doing? Uh, Russell Sherwin, I run the marketing for IBM Watson Commerce, which means I have a team responsible for helping retailers, as well as B2B organizations, market, sell, and fulfill more effectively in an ever-changing omni-channel world. That's awesome. It's going to be exciting. So last month, you published a really great article that talked about the insights of how you take some of this AI work and start to help retailers look at that information and drive their business. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Uh, so, and if I recall the article right, it was um, one where we spoke about some of our customers like Carhartt and Calvin Klein brands. Uh, and if you've watched TV over the past year, you know that IBM and probably the rest of the world is talking about artificial intelligence. Now, yeah. artificial intelligence, it's not new technology, but the hardware is caught up so we can make it a reality. And what you're starting to see, and we're starting to see, is those first couple of use cases are going from concept and imagination to having an impact in the real world. So I'll give you a couple areas where we're seeing impact happening today. Um, one retailer during the holiday season, I mean, a little known part about site merchandising. You have a website, you have product category pages, and people think it's simple. You go to the website, you pick out the dress you want, you click buy and you buy. Well, who decides how to sequence um, products on, on, a, on a catalog page, on a category page. There are merchandisers whose sole job is to sequence those products effectively. That's a great point. So, in the previous world, I mean, this is, this is, the, way, this is the formal decision-making process. A 26-year-old would make that decision. Right? It's a gut feel. Watson understands lots of information. So, during the holiday season, Watson, understanding inventory positions, would make recommendations, or on his own, were permitted, would drive intelligent sequencing to put, let's say, a, a piece of inventory that was out of stock off the page. Whereas there's a lot of times inventory that's out of stock will get the top billing on a page. Or inventory that was about to go on markdown will get top billing to optimize for profitability. And so that, that's one example of where artificial intelligence is being used. And I could give you more examples if well, you like. Well, let's talk about that example. So in the holidays, you had, a, uh, you had some customers that were starting to use this. What was the impact to them? How were they able to change the business? Oh, it's huge. And obviously, I can't talk specific results. Uh, just, you know, out of stocks, down because you're putting out inventory you could sell. And when you factor in the fact that IBM Sterling Order Management understands inventory positions at a store level and understands the geography of a store and also understands where that audience, that, that person on the page is coming from, it can map up local inventory and hyper-localization hyper to that particular individual. That's very cool. And I can imagine that that actually probably drives the consumer's experience up because now they're getting information that they can actually act on versus things that are out of stock or us merchandising things that they can't have. Absolutely. Let's take an out of stock for a second. You go to your favorite store. You go to uh, themenswarehouse.com, let's say a nice generic place. That, that looks well beyond <laughs> menswarehouse.com, but let's just go generic. And they're a great customer, Taylor brand, so i got to give them a bit of a plug here. Um, and that purple jacket you're looking for is out of stock. How do you feel? Awful. Who feels even worse than you? The sales guy. Exactly. And so being able to mitigate out of stocks, I mean, there's a trillion dollars in out of stocks that happen. That's great. That's great feedback. Let's change gears a little bit. So that's the power of doing this. Some people have criticized AI and said, you know, the problem is that it actually takes on some of the biases that the programmers have. How do you make sure that that doesn't happen to something like Watson? Or, or how do you react to that simple statement? So. It's a great question, and I, I, I kind of would like to go back and give a couple more use case examples and spell off, but let me go address the question because that would be Sounds unfair. Good. So first of all, AI, it, it's, a, it's a great topic. It's a buzzword. It's Kool-Aid, right? But what it fundamentally is is it's neural network technology. And who out there, I, wow, we got an audience. Cool. I thought we were just talking to ourselves here. <laughs> who, which of you all have, um, who have you studied neural network programming? No, just kidding. Okay, <laughs> I have. So what you're ultimately doing is, is you're training a learning system. And the greatest example I find of understanding AI 
is when I teach my two-year-old. My two-year-old's a sponge, and you're, you're teaching him how to think. You're feeding him data sets, and you're telling him, you know, if you say one plus one is three, well, that's wrong. The, the system learns. One plus one is two, the system gets it. You put images in front, you tell him, let's say Watson Content Hub, which is our tagging system for images, right? It's a content management system. You infuse in images, and you're teaching it, say, this is a red hat, this is a blue hat, this is a green hat. Okay, so the concept, the red, blue, and green is coming in. And then you say, hat, okay, this is what a hat looks like, and, and it starts learning context. To answer your question directly, it's impossible. I mean, getting past the buzzwords, it's impossible to get rid of bias. Bias is, is a fact of life. But what you can do, and this is one of the things IT departments and businesses will struggle with for quite some time, is you have to surround the AI learning process with different points of references, different cultural points of reference. And that's that's just as much a factor of, for me, making sure that my kid goes to school, I put him in a diverse multicultural environment so his learning is, is not filled with bias, with the same thing as a learning system. Got it. It can't get rid of bias because it learns, a neural network, it learns the same exact way the human brain learns. That's, that's a great answer. Thank you. And I think, again, to try and bring this into how this works, one of the benefits of having a system like this is you can also correct. So. Just like with a two-year-old that you talked about, while they learn bad things, you can also teach them how to correct off of that. Correct. Uh, and this is where I think uh, the industry will go because in many ways, merchandising uh, is an A-B test game. And with the kinds of technologies you guys are bringing to market, you can start to A-B test and learn correct versus incorrect mm -hmm. at hyper speeds versus the way humans would do it. So it's a very exciting space. Um, you know, the other thing you did uh, maybe a couple weeks ago is you tweeted that we got to get uh, have retailers start fighting against the digital disruption. What did you mean by that, and how is AI going to help them do that? It's, it's a great question. Uh, and so the question, I'll rephrase it, it's what do we mean by retailers need to go on the offensive against digital disruption? Yeah. Any retailers out there? Well, for those, for those I, I imagine somewhere at NRF exists a retailer. <laughs> and... If you're not feeling the strain of Amazon, you're in trouble. I'll give you an example. So I, I used to lead the sales organization, and we did we had one multi-billion dollar retailer is dropping 20% of stores, but they're shifting the dollars to e-commerce. And we're talking about what's the future, where you're going to go. And as we're getting to know each other better personally, you know, it gets to 12 a.m., 1 a.m., we're out to drinks. He's like, dude, what are we supposed to do? Get in the fetal position and die? We're gonna have to fight back, and a little bit farther in the conversation, it's like, what am I supposed to do? My what? And this this is an office supply company. My <laughs> wife buys freaking pens from Amazon. What are we supposed to do? So there's there's a general sense from 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 retailers uh, within specific segments that there's an existential crisis, and it's not caused by Amazon. It's caused by not driving intimacy with customers. It's not creating the experience needed. It's not giving I the see. price needed. So let me answer your question directly because um, I'm not. I'm just rambling as opposed to answering your question. Going on the offensive means what I have experienced in my customer base is most retailers. Their DNA is being a retailer. Amazon is a technology company that understands retail better than most retailers because their data gives them better customer insight. And to go on the offensive, it means companies who are not digital natives, it's not in their DNA, they need to fight Amazon and go on the offensive. And my take on this is this. For years, the Walmarts, the Staple, all the brick and mortar retailers have been playing catch up because Amazon, as, as you know from your background, has been a step ahead. And going on the offensive means innovating. And by innovating means building bridges between their product product markets and building better intimacy with customers and creating either better experiences, better prices, or better means to get the product to the customer or better services that differentiate the offerings. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, all right, last question, and then we'll wrap it up, and we'll have you close. When you think about the future of retail, and you think about this offense, what do you think the next few trends are going to be, and where should retailers be looking to be able to go drive the next generation experiences? Yeah, can I take a couple minutes to answer that question? <laughs> I got all the time in the world. All right. So a couple places we could go with that. First of all, I think the future is in the past. I, I see we've got, still got this audience here. So how many of you out there know FAO Schwartz? Awesome, we got a bunch of people who know FAO Schwartz. Who, who was shopping there back in the 90s? Who, who saw the movie Big? Huh. Awesome. So 
Peter Harris is a guy I was lucky enough to, to meet and has become a mentor. Peter Harris was the old guy in Big who danced on the piano. And that character was modeled after the former CEO of FAO Schwartz. And so I remember as I got to know him better, I said, dude, how the did you make money? Because everybody knows that FAO Schwartz, you wander around the store, you got 40 foot high stuffed animals, and you have the, the massive piano, and you have all sorts of stuff that no one in their right minds would ever buy. And so how do you make money? And so Peter explained that they build this magnificent maze. You have these exclusives with Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers, and, and all this stuff no one's gonna buy. And you walk around the store and you say, Mommy, can I buy, no. Mommy, can I have that, no. Mommy, can I get that, no. And by the time you get to the end of the store, the mom is feeling like garbage because they said no 20 times. The kid is wiry. He wants something. And there are these clowns at the end of the store who are playing with these goofy light-up yo-yos. And there's a unit cost of $1.99 in these yo-yos, and they're marked up to $25. FAO Schwartz made all their money with their primary segment on that $23 markup by creating an experience. And, and here, to, getting back to answering your questions, what's the future of retail? It's understanding your segments and creating an experience that tailors to them. But there's a caveat there. Segment, that, what, that segment one in Peter Harris's business strategy was the segment's families, destination visits, going to New York City to see a retail outlet, right? That is a massive segment. In the future, it's segments of one, hyper-personalization, Understanding that I'm Jay Jill and I'm marketing to Jane Smith and Jane Smith is three months away from being a grandma for the first time and there are events in that person's life that's going to drive decisions and understanding in what medium to get to her and what message to get to her and what's the content and the offer at the right time that's going to drive a conversion at the same time that drives loyalty. And there's other pieces, I'm going to keep going here. And it's not just, it's doing all that profitably. I mean, I bet if I wander around this crazy place, I'm going to see 20% of the vendors are going to, it, it's a rule, you have to say omni-channel somewhere in your booth, <laughs> right? Buy online pick, uh, and uh, you know, owning Sterling Order Management, you know, when, when Best Buy does buy online pick up in store, it's my technology driving it. So doing that profitably is a different story. I'll give an example. There is one $20 billion retailer that during the holiday season knows that their store inventory is a weapon shipped from store. Doing the profitably is a different story. So Watson Order Optimizer, and I, again, I see the future, the future retail. Watson helping create personalized experience. Here it's Watson driving order optimization. If I have a multi-line order, what's the most profitable way to ship it, to break down the individual line items and ship it? But that's not the easiest question in the world because what if one of the items I'm ordering is about to go on markdown? Perfect. Those sorts of things. That's, that's perfect. Um, Thank you very much. That uh, was a great session. Uh, if I just wrap this up for you in this way, if you think about some of the data and some of the services like Watson that we're talking about, and then you overlay Verifone Connect that allows you to take merchant experiences, personalization experiences for consumers, and bring those together to create an end-to-end -end experience where the merchants are growing, the consumers are having a better personalized experience. That is exactly what we're showing here today. So if you haven't had a chance, please take a look at some of the booths. Uh, we have exactly what we've talked about online uh, here for everybody from a small coffee shop all the way to the tier one largest retailers that are out there in the world. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the show. Thank you.